Hey folks, in this interview, it's all about Panasonic's new S1R full frame mirrorless camera. This is Twit. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the show, I've got Mr. Shiv Verma to talk about Panasonic's new full-frame mirrorless camera, one of which is the S1R. I believe he got his hands on one. I'm a little bit jealous, but we're going to talk about that today. Shiv Verma, how are you doing, man? Welcome back to This Week in Photo. It's been it's been a while since uh, I did one of these with you. But, uh, you know, as always, it's, it's a pleasure. And, th you know, the nice thing about it is that uh, you know, we get to talk about things that we both enjoy and, uh, you know, it's something that uh, could, in fact, you know, as I said before in one of our previous shows, we could just go on and on and on and never stop talking. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, the S1R, uh, I'm looking forward to discussing this with you. Uh, just briefly, I mean, I was, I was thrilled to, uh, you know, be at the launch event, uh, you know, before uh, the full product was released, and we were playing around with some uh, pre-production units. Uh, you know, had some of the uh, press and some of the advocates and some of the influencers. Uh, you know, spent two days with us. So it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, then uh, I managed to sneak out one of the units uh, to, <laughs> to to Death Valley, which was uh, which was exceptional. I mean, it was great. Uh, not, not realizing that I wouldn't be able to process the raw files, but uh, you know now that's not an issue anymore. So I actually had to go back and uh, you know process everything that I had shot at that particular show. So uh, you know life is good. I mean uh, you know the camera is just absolutely phenomenal. Well, I want to talk. That's what I want to talk about. Is obviously is the the camera itself. So you're you. Th this is the the like we said the S one R. This is the full frame one of the, the Panasonic released two full frame cameras. This is one yeah. of them. Yeah. I want to talk about the positioning of the the S one versus the S one R and why you why you have the S one R aside from smuggling it you know out. <laughs> you know. So I want to no, talk. Actually, yeah, I want yeah, to talk actually, about that. So tell me tell me about the positioning uh, of the actually, cameras first. Uh, actually, uh, let me correct you. It's yeah, actually, for it. now three cameras, not two. So it's, it's three. The, yeah, it's the S1. Yep. The S1R and the fully video centric S1H. Okay, uh, right. So yeah, the S1H was was announced I think 2 weeks ago um, and it's uh, not all the details have been released, but, uh, you know, the product has been announced. So it is in the S1 family. It is a full frame. Um, and I think follows the same, you know, class and, you know, body style and uh, the bulk and hulk, I uh, call it. I mean, these these cameras are actual beasts. I mean, they're they are big, they're heavy and they're built like a tank. So. Uh, the S1R is, in my opinion, actually, the camera that is uh, a landscape photographer, portrait photographer, studio user camera. Uh, absolutely phenomenal in its resolution, phenomenal in its capabilities. Uh, the S1 is a uh, basically same form factor but uh, a lower resolution and a little bit more oriented towards video. Uh, it's you know been upgraded now with some firmware that allows it to have uh, full vlog capabilities and uh, you know 422 and all, all the video centric stuff uh, that was previously announced but not available and the nice thing is that uh, you know upgrading the camera today uh, I believe it's uh, to some extent free uh, so that makes a big difference and then of course the s1h uh, which, you know, the preliminary information uh, was released. Uh, now we're just waiting for the final specs. Yeah. Yeah, so talk a little bit about, to the, to the extent that you can, Shiv, talk a little bit about the idea from Panasonic. And, and both of you, both of us know Panasonic intimately, right? So, you know, yeah, we, yeah, we're yeah. In, that, in that family, so to speak. Um, I shoot with my G9, that's that's my camera of choice. I love that camera for very specific reasons, size being one of them. Um, but the the advent of this this full frame line of cameras 
seems to be, and this is me playing, being devil's advocate, throwing this question at you, seems to be in direct opposition to the ethos of the micro four thirds camera being smaller, lighter, but still at, at least as capable as its full frame brethren. What's the, what's the party line response to well, the people that say that? Well, I mean, I, I'm sure there's there's lots of party lines. Panasonic has has their own uh, statements, but what, what I'd like to to really bring up and get the audience to understand is that the Micro Four Thirds family was is absolutely exceptional. There's no two ways about it. I mean, it is lighter. Uh, the form factor allows you know smaller lenses, longer reach. I mean, you, you're talking about you know 800 millimeter equivalents in a lens that's no bigger than a 70 to 200. So, you know, clearly you've got massive, massive advantages of the smaller form factor. But, you know, then there was a little bit of a disadvantage too. I mean, they, they didn't have a product that would fulfill the needs of the professional uh, photographer who worked products, somebody who was really, you know, sort of focused in on landscape photography or architectural photography, particularly because, you know, the, the higher resolution does make a difference. And to some extent, and you and I have both heard this a lot, you know, what about the shallower depth of field? What about faster lenses? What about giving us the opportunity of blowing out the background? And I think with the introduction of the S series, all of those have been debunked. I mean, there's no more issue. Uh, you've got a camera that is fully capable of resolving. Uh, I mean, if you look at basic resolution, uh, you know, 47 megapixels and in high res mode, uh, and we can talk more about that. You're talking about 187 megapixels. So, yeah. uh, you know, the, these these things clearly make the camera just, you know, a step above and beyond most everything that is out there. Now, it's not a medium format camera. So let's not let's not even discuss that aspect. But it gives you the resolution that most medium format cameras had. You using know, using that using that sensor shift technology where it's moving the no, sensor no, no. E, 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 even, even out of the box. That. Yeah, yeah, even out of the box. I mean, 50 megapixels is what you typically saw in the medium format range. Yeah. And, you know, the sensor is actually 50 megapixel sensor. Its effective pixels are 47. So you, you've got, I mean, you know, short of three megapixels, you've got basically the same resolution as you had with medium format. So yeah. I don't see any reason why anybody would uh, turn around and say, I don't have enough resolution. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, with pixel shifting, you've got a whole different ball game altogether. But talk about so speaking of resolution, if you're if you're looking at if you're looking at it from the standpoint of of um, you like you're you're a travel mm -hmm. photographer, right? So you you travel to parts unknown all the time and you are taking people out there, you're leading workshops and shooting wild animals and staying alive and coming back to tell the story with the with the yeah, images yeah. these cameras are bigger than micro four thirds and like i said part of the allure of the micro four thirds line of cameras is is their diminutive size and the ability to carry a bunch of lenses in the space of just one full frame lens are you concerned with the shift over to a larger uh, system well here's the thing i i love wildlife, I love nature, and I love landscape. And then as, you know, a part of my earnings, I've been doing product photography. So, you know, this now allows me to do everything. Uh, will I take this as a primary uh, camera for my nature and wildlife or to shoot birds and, uh, you know, you know, animals that are running? Not at the moment, because I just don't have the reach. I mean, I, I need longer lenses until those are available. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, put the G9 away, because the G9 is absolutely exceptional for that type of photography. So, you know, I always tell photographers, use the tool that you need to do the job with. So the 9 does the job of, you know, nature, wildlife, and the S does the job of the landscape, the architecture, and, you know, the features that one typically was craving for. And, and also, to some extent, the larger sensor gives you an opportunity for a low-light 
uh, photography, which is, uh, you know, another piece that I love. I mean, doing some uh, astrophotography, doing some, you know, light painting with still lives and things like that. So, uh, you know, it, it bridges it bridges that gap that there was before. I mean, now that we'll, tell, we'll talk about that. Talk about the astrophotography piece of it, because I'm, I'm really interested in hearing about the because I I'm I've been bitten by the astrophotography bug and I want to get out and actually try some. I'm concerned that I won't be able to 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 get the quality with my G9 that I would with a full frame camera like the S1 S1R. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, in other well, words, put a finer point on it. Can I create killer images with my G9, or do I need to buy an upgrade to a full frame camera in order to do that? Yeah, I'll go back to I don't know whether it was our first twip that we did. Uh, I don't know how many years ago. Yeah, I think it's but... like 150 years. Back. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I I was in Iceland and I took a GH3. Okay. I mean, not a GH4, not a GH5, not the 9. I took a GH3, and uh, I came back with some exceptional time lapse of the Aurora Borealis, uh, you know, including, you know, the stars and, and all the, the light display and everything. And I, I think it was great. I mean, it wasn't exceptional, but it was great. Uh, with the GH4, it became better. With the GH5, uh, you know, I, uh, there was no reason to complain. And then you have the GH5S, which is a low-light beast. So, you know, the issues that people complain about is is noise. And noise is something that if you are going to be doing astrophotography, uh, you're not going to rely on the camera to take the, the noise issue out of the equation. You're going to basically shoot multiple images and use your software to combine right. them so that you can get rid of the noise. So the the issue is not the camera that you use. The issue is the technique that you use. Well, now, clearly, yes, the S1 will give you better low-light performance. Right. It has a higher ISO range. But, you know, how often do you want to shoot higher than 6,400 ISO for night photography? You're not going to do it. So Well, you, you said a very salient point there. You said... Um, you you can get good photography out of say a G9 or a, or a Micro Four Thirds sensor doing astrophotography, but not exceptional. So I think, uh, you know, I, so that is where I like hit the brakes. I'm like, well, if I want to do that kind of photography, I don't even want to attempt it if I'm not going to be able to approach being exceptional with it, right? So well, so what what's the how do you solve for that? How do you solve for being able to or want the desire to always create exceptional imagery? But you also want a smaller camera. Like, what, what's the fix for that? Well, I think the, the fix is, again, I go back to technique. And, and exceptional is, uh, it's a term that I've used to say, if you know how to do astro, just for example, if you're taking multiple images, uh, your stars, in fact, are moving relative. The Earth is moving. The stars don't move. So the star position will change. Your landscape is not going to change. So the technique really is when you start combining this is to keep the landscape in its relative stationary position and then stack the stars so that you a get rid of the noise in the background and you also have the intensity that you need for uh, you know the, the light that the stars are emitting. So that's, again, I go back to technique. Now, yes, a smaller sensor will heat up quicker, uh, will start generating noise. A larger sensor will heat up slower and not generate that much noise. But eventually, it's really your style and your technique that's going to make the exceptional image, not the camera. Yeah. Yeah, what are, what are, you, what are your thoughts on how to learn that stuff, on how to be... You know, uh, this is for me personally because mm -hmm. I, I want to. I know the concepts of doing astrophotography. Yeah, is it yeah. like anything else where you're say, hey, just go to Iceland to get yourself a good tripod and a tent and sit out, <laughs> sit out there and make your shots, or well, should I get some more book learning in there? I, I think I think you know, there's two kinds of astrophotography. There's one where you're actually you know looking at photographing stars and the Milky Way and that yep. kind of stuff. Yep. And then there is, quote, night photography, where you're looking at shooting the Aurora Borealis. Yeah. So, you know, the Aurora Borealis is give you the kind of practice that you need, because 
the intensity changes. I mean, you could be shooting the Aurora Borealis at 800 ISO, at 400 ISO. Uh, if it's really weak, you may need to go up to 3200 ISO. And sometimes even 100 ISO might become too bright based upon, you know, how long your shutter is open for. So, you know, clearly that's not the the objective of learning astrophotography. And then you don't combine images when you're doing the aurora. I mean, you're, yeah. you're looking at time lapse, you want to depict the motion, the movement, etc. Whereas with astro, you want to make everything go stationary, uh, unless, of course, uh, you're into star trails, which then is a different realm of, uh, you know, how you photograph it. Yeah. But eventually, uh, you know, it's uh, like everything, Frederick, it's practice, practice, practice. You, yeah. you get it right with practice. You don't get it right by, you know, you can read a book. It'll give you some tips. You can go to a workshop. You'll get some ideas. But eventually, unless you do it often, and bring it into software and combine it, uh, you're not going to get there. And you say, what's the old saying? How do you, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 practice. yes. So, so you should... I mean, like all photography, it's all practice. Yeah, no, I know. And I want what to, I, what I want to make sure we hammer home in this, this mm -hmm. discussion is the, so the Panasonic's lineup has changed in terms of, or the Lumix lineup has changed in terms of the options that photographers have available to them. You know, it's, it's always been the micro four thirds. And then now it's where we're well into the full frame going head to head with the Sony and the Nikons and the Canons and all those guys. Um, yeah. If someone is looking at the line and, and I'll say one of, one of the reasons why I gravitate towards Lumix is the operating system and the menuing system. I like the way that it's laid out and, and sort of popping around in there versus what you'd find on mm -hmm. say a Sony or yeah, yeah. some other yeah. cameras. Um, but if someone's looking at the line right now, at the Lumix line, and they're like, you know what, I want to jump into Lumix, but, you know, I've been hearing all these years that Micro Four Thirds is the way, it's fine, it's great, it's small, it's nimble. Um, and, but on the other side, I hear Sony saying that full frame is superior to everything known to man. Panasonic now has a full frame. Should I be considering that and saving up my dollars for that? I know you may say it depends on the kind of photography you're shooting, but you know, abstracting that out of the conversation, mm -hmm. what's a good way for them to, for a, a potential customer of Lumix to make a decision between micro four thirds and full frame? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolution. We, that's what we've seen. I mean, we've seen micro four thirds. You know, that's, that's what the base was that Panasonic started with over mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, and, the, and then you think about the sensor size. I mean, it, you know, 16 was the, quote, limit. And everybody said, you know, micro four thirds, you should not go more than 16 megapixels. And then 20 became the limit. And we had some exceptional sensors for, for 20 megapixels. I mean, the G9 is a good example. Uh, and, and now even the lower end, you know, we're looking at 20 megapixels with, uh, you know, the 95. You're looking at uh, cameras that have that 20 megs of megapixel resolution, which is more than sufficient for most people. So, you know, to your point, you said, you know, it depends upon what kind of photography you do, but it's really also, what is it that you're going to do with the photograph? Mm -hmm. Is it something that is, you know, going to be blown up into some, you know, gigantic poster, some mural or, or some of you know, uh, something that's going to be put, put up on somebody's wall? Or is it something that uh, is going to be typically shown on, you know, your Instagrams, your Facebooks, and, and that type of, uh, you know, outlet? If that's the outlet, then what do you need full frame for? And you asked a question, you know, why, you know, Sony versus Panasonic? It's not really yeah. why Sony versus Panasonic. I think what Panasonic has done, it it's it's made its it's you call it software i call it its menu system that is so beautifully laid out that you don't have to kind of learn a second language just to be able to use it yeah uh, whereas with a lot of others you do need a second language and and things are not buried you know four or five layers deep i mean we've got cameras today uh, both micro four thirds as well as uh, full frame and aps c where you go four layers deep and you still aren't there. 
And yeah. you're kind of wondering, you know, what am I going to do and how do I get to it quickly? So, you know, that kind of layout, that kind of menuing system. Uh, the other thing which to me is very important is the ergonomics. Mm -hmm. And the, the ergonomics of both the G series as well as the S series is really, you know, absolutely just out of this world. Uh, you know, the, the S series, a lot of people compare it to shape, size, and whatever of the Leica SL. But you look at the ergonomics, you look at the button layout, you look at the dial layout, it is just out of this world. I mean, it's it feels natural. If you, if you were going to go out and shoot a... Um you know, do some, some model photography and shoot, do some fashion type stuff and portraiture, um, having access to all the camera gear that you have now, including the full frame Panasonic, which one would you gravitate to, to do a, you know, a full on professional client job, um, that needs to result in ultra exceptional images, which would you move well, to? Well, it's, is, is it the camera or is it the lens? And, uh, or both, yeah. let's say both, what <laughs> combination? It's actually both. So, you have today, um, you know, a lens uh, combination. Basically, if you just stay within uh, the uh, the Panasonic Lumix line, I mean, let's not go to the Leica lenses or to third-party lenses. Just staying within uh, the uh, the framework of using Panasonic lenses. We have three lenses with the S series. You've got a, you know, 24 to uh, 120. You've got uh, 7200 and then you have an absolutely brilliant 50 millimeter lens yeah for portraiture typically you're looking at a lens that's going to be 85 millimeters through you know 120 so the 24 to 120 fits that uh focal length but it's an f4 lens yeah and you know till the new lens comes out, which you know, is slated to be uh, 2470, I believe, f2.8. You don't have a lens that's going to be wide open. Now, again, portraiture depends upon style. I mean, do some people are looking for very shallow depth of field. Uh, you know, they're looking for a lens that's 1.8, 1.4 in that range. Uh, and we don't have that yet. But can you physically move yourself to still generate that kind of out of focus background generate that kind of bokeh yes you can uh, on the micro four thirds side the 42.5 uh, noctocron lens is to die for i mean mm -hmm. tell me i have that lens i love that and, lens so much and, yeah. and 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 that lens basically satisfies the requirement of every portrait photographer i mean i show me a portrait photographer who doesn't want to use that lens yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 not it's not going to be, and that's why I say it. It really depends upon you know what it is that you need. I mean, if you're going to make poster size images, you're going to make you know six foot murals or you know whatever it is. Yeah, you you want a higher resolution camera. Yeah. But go back to an image that you probably saw. It was on the Panasonic website, which I took with an LX. Uh, what was it? The LX100. And uh, I only used eight megapixels of that, and I blew that image up to seven feet by five and a half feet. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and it was, uh, there's no issue. So, you know, really, it's it's what is it that you're looking to do? And if you want to be nimble, uh, I think you know, wedding photographers, photographers who do a lot of portrait work, not in studio. If you're outside and you're wanting to carry cameras around. Uh, you know, I'd keep an S1 in my bag for those photographs where I need to resolve uh, at a higher resolution. But most part, I'd, I'd still use the G9. And uh, you know, the, the, the image quality is really exceptional. I mean, it's awesome. Well, yeah. well, well, let's wrap this up. And I wanted to sort of get an idea of what's next on the Shiv Verma travel schedule. We mentioned that you travel the world like Indiana Jones <laughs> looking for photographic <laughs> adventures. What's uh, what's next on your, your calendar? Where are you heading to next? Well, I, I'll tell you that I, I've got to mention this. And before I tell you where I'm going next, I went to I was actually in Seattle. Uh, we did a a session with one of the camera companies over there and I uh, then took off and 
spent two days in the Palouse. Uh, I'd never been there, so it was a brand new experience. And uh, on the last morning, I was able to, so I got, got up onto Steptoe Butte and it was cloudy, it was horrible. It was just, and I was just wondering, you know, what am I doing over here? Should I start driving back down or, or just stay a little bit more? And uh, I decided to stay. And I think it was about the best thing I ever did. Of all of my landscape images, there is one image that I have personally fallen in love with. And that was an image at the Palouse where we had about three to four minutes of the sun peeking out. And uh, I just, I just, till today, just look at that image and I say, thank God I stayed. And, uh, you know, just so you're, shot you're, that. you're taking a group of people back there? Um, not, well, I, I'm going back to Spokane for the PSA conference in September. But I think the harvest season will be over by the time we get there. So I'm not sure whether it's going to be worth taking a group this this year. But next year, definitely, I want to do it uh, in the June time frame uh, because you know, the, the wheat fields are just beautiful. And, you know, the combination of planted fields versus fields that have just been prepared for planting mm -hmm. uh, allows for that, you know, mixed of greens and browns and that deep earth tones that, that are absolutely exquisite. So, you know, June next year. The next uh, leg, um, well, I've got the New England Camera Club Council Conference coming up next month. And then after that, it's Tanzania. And uh, then it's Iceland. So, like yeah. I said, Indiana Jones, right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, if you've got to travel, then keep traveling. Don't stop. Don't yeah, stop. yeah. Why not? It's a it's a big world and a small world at the same time, right? True, true, true. So and if, now, prepping, no, for, prepping for uh, actually starting work for a uh, a workshop in Namibia next year. So, that's, oh, yeah. That's uh, yeah. who maybe, else goes maybe to Namibia? You come Is that? Country? That's that's Martin. Does Martin Bailey go out there? I think Ma he's... Martin. Martin does. Yes, Martin does. Well, Martin does Iceland. Martin does Namibia. Uh, Martin does Japan, which I don't do. Uh, so you know, you I, I'll... yeah, Japan. <laughs> you don't do the snow monkeys. Come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> Did you have a bad experience with snow monkeys in the past? You <laughs> no bad experience with the snow monkeys, and and not to negate them, I think they're absolutely gorgeous, but. You know, you, if you are a nature wildlife photographer and you tend to, even though I don't anymore, uh, if you compete in the uh, realm of nature photography or wildlife photography, then you can't have them in a controlled environment or in a man-made environment. And most of the snow monkeys come down to bathe in those pools that are all man-made. So uh, even though you can make them appear uh, as though they're not, but, you know, ethically they're not in their natural habitat per yeah. se. So, well, yeah, I stay or, away or, from that. Or you could just argue that the planet is their natural habitat and they're on oh, the planet. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so they just happen to yeah. be at some place else on the planet. Oh, well, yeah. cool. Oh, if, yeah. If, uh, if people want to catch up with you and kind of check out some of the work that you are doing and, and see what you're doing with that new S1R, where, what's a good location for them to go to? Uh, everything through my website, www.shivverma.com. Uh, I am on Instagram, Facebook, on the Panasonic websites, but uh, you can get to most everything from uh, one central location, which is uh, my personal website. So Awesome. Yeah. Well, Sir Verma, thank you for coming on. I got to tell you that you're one of the few guests that I have on the show that your camera and your lighting look as good or better than mine. So good. Oh, <laughs> does my camera look better than yours? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me see that one. What is that? Is that, that the? Oh yeah, it does look better. I don't have that one. <laughs> okay, so a double qualification: the setup and the setup. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, good. Keep it up. It's all about quality, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I tell you, I mean, I would say in closing, everybody who has shot full frame or has shot medium format, just do me a favor. Don't have to buy it. Just go rent it. Rent an S1R or rent an S1, two days, three days with one or two lenses and go and try it out. And you'll get an understanding 
of why I'm so passionate about it. And, you know, I, uh, somebody said this earlier, so I don't want to steal their thunder uh, and not use the same words. But personally, I have been shooting with Leicas, with Zeiss Icons, with Hasselblads, with Roliflexes, you name it. Um, and then, and of course, in the digital world with a bunch of cameras. This S1R today, in my opinion and my feeling, is about the best camera I have ever, ever used. So I'll say it and I'll, and I'll challenge anybody to disprove me. All right. Well, you heard that, you know, if you if you have a competing opinion about the best camera ever, yeah. sound off in the comments for this video. And, and, and maybe then, Frederick, you could have a, you know, a session where we duel it out. I'm, yeah, that's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, yeah, that is not a bad idea. Cool. All right. Well, Shiv Verma, thank, thank you so much for coming thank on, man. You. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks, Frederick. You take care. Have a wonderful evening. OK, you too. Talk to you soon. Bye. This is Twitter.